Welcome to class. Happy Wednesday. The second to last class of the semester. Yay. Like almost a half hearted and defeated. Yay. I feel like calling that. Uh, before the next, before the final. So we then finally, we've been studying lambda calculus, we finally come to the craziest part of lambda calculus. So we've built up Boolean operations, so we can do ands, ors, nots, uh, we have true and false values, we have branching, so we can do if branches. Now, at kind of as we saw at the end of class on Monday, so we have Boolean logic, 
We have arithmetic, so we can do mathematical <laughs> operations on things that represent numbers, right? We don't have actual numbers to work with. When you think about it, that's fine, right? The computer, the CPU does not have actual numbers to work with either. All the CPU has is 32 ones and zeros that we interpret in a certain number to mean a certain number. Right, so very, this is very similar to how we've done arithmetic, right? We create a lambda expression a certain way, and we're saying this represents the number one or the number two. Okay, so we have arithmetic. So we've talked about what we need, but we're missing loops. We have no way to loop, right? And we've seen this in the factorial function. So we have, for those who don't remember, the factorial function is the factorial of zero is one, the factorial of n is n times the factorial of n minus 1. Right? This is pretty much this and Fibonacci are kind of the standard things we use to teach recursive uh, functions, which is kind of silly because you don't really, uh, there's very few times you have to write a factorial function in your career, but you often have to iterate over a tree data structure like you're doing in your parsing. So that's more of the type of recursion you'll do. Anyways. So we can code this up in C, and we can see that we have a factorial function that takes in an integer value n, checks if n is 0, return 1. This is the base case of our recursion. Otherwise, return n times the factorial of n minus 1. <coughs> Standard factorial we all know and love. So if we assume, so we've, we've defined actually everything in lambda calculus that we need for this, except for is 0. So we have a function that takes in a number. If it's 0, it returns true. If it's not 0, it returns false. We could write that if we wanted to. We also assume we have a predecessor function, so an n minus 1 function. So it gives you n, and it returns n minus 1. So assuming we have that, we can just easily translate that factorial function into a lambda expression. So we have factorial is equal to lambda n if is 0 n return 1. Otherwise, return multiply n times factorial of the predecessor of n, right, where predecessor is n minus 1. So this is a direct translation of times return n times n minus 1. Questions on this? Yes? Isn't that uh, illegal, given that you're defining factorial with? <coughs> yes, it is illegal. So this is not actually a lambda expression. Right? We have definition, so we have a lambda. We have a lambda, so here we have an abstraction. We have lambda n. And we have if. We've already defined if, so we can replace this fully with the body of if. We are saying we have an is zero function, so we can expand that. We know one here does not represent the number one. It is a placeholder for the church numeral, the lambda expression that represents one. The multiply, we know we have a multiply function. But now when we get to this factorial function, how would we expand that out? Right? And the problem is, fundamentally, we can't because we're trying to use factorial in defining itself. So this is a place where we'd like to use recursion. And this is how we do recursion when we have function calls in, uh, when we have recursive calls in our C code. Right? Inside the, and this relates to scoping rules. Right? When a function is declared, its name is available to be used in the body of its own function. So you can call factorial from factorial, and that's how we get awesome recursion. There are some early languages that didn't have that, where you only had procedures. So you could only call them, call a procedure, and then that procedure could not call any other procedures. It could just do stuff and then return. So you didn't have any recursion in there. Okay. Cool. So this function, even though this seems so easy to write, and this is really a straightforward translation of what we had in the C code to here to the Lambda code. Right? And so this, to me, brings up a lot of interesting questions of, do we need names of functions in, it in order to be able to write recursive Lambda functions? Right? That was kind of the point of where we're starting with Lambda calculus. All anonymous functions, completely 100% anonymous. And so, I kind of teased this, I've been teasing this really throughout the whole time we've been talking about lambda calculus. So, a combinator, what's a combinator? Yeah, so a lambda expression with no free variables. 
Cool. So there are, well, maybe you can tell because this is called the Y Combinator. There are a lot of different combinators. They all have different names. And usually they're just one letter combinators. They each do different things. To be honest, I don't know all of them. One of them is that ID combinator we've seen of lambda x dot x, which just returns its parameter. Has anybody ever heard this term in other usage that is not lambda calculus related in this class? Yeah, so what did you hear it from? It's a startup uh, incubator. Yeah, so it's a startup incubator. Do you know who co founded? Peter Thiel, right? Uh, no. He uh, is a partner of theirs. Uh, so it was Paul Graham and Trevor Blackwell, I want to say, is one of the other ones. And I think Robert Tappan Morris was the third person there, uh, along with Jessica, and I cannot remember her last name. Anyways, they all started, originally started this company in the 90s called BioWeb, where they were making um, it easy for people to have online stores. And so their startup eventually got bought by Yahoo and became Yahoo Stores, this really big platform. So they got tons of money. And so they decided, hey, we want to become a start. We want to make it easier for other people to make startups, right? And so when they were looking around for names, they actually looked to Lambda Calculus and thought back on their days. And actually, it, it ties in very well because BioWeb was written in Lisp. So Lisp derives a lot of its notations from Lambda Calculus. So they named their startup incubator Y Combinator. So I'm going to leave that there for now. We're going to look at it, and I'm going to look back and to think why they named it that and how that kind of ties in there. So if any of you are thinking about doing a startup, and you end up applying for Y Combinator's uh, program, you can tell them you know exactly why they named it Y Combinator, and that you actually understand the Y Combinator. That would be really cool. Uh, and then when you make a lot of money, you can come back to ASU and donate it to ASU. <laughs> Sold. But we need more. Other people. Okay, so. We're going to look at the Y Combinator, and then we're going to kind of pick it apart to try to see what it does. I'm just going to kind of present it here at first, because it's something that is very much non-obvious. Uh, it is, again, one of these things where you, know, ha you have to take that kind of intuition leap to come up with this, and then you can see that it has the properties that you want. OK, so the Y Combinator, lambda x dot lambda y y x x y space lambda x dot lambda y dot y x x y so what is it composed of at a high level yeah so at a high level it's actually an application right so each of these expressions here, how many parameters are they taking in? Two. So they first take in an x and then take in a y. So let's step through to see what happens when we just say y foo. Okay. So we'll just try to see what this does. We'll try to take it step by step. So we have this whole huge thing, right? So what's the first thing that happens? Mm, you guys know there's a final on Monday, right? <laughs> Sorry, that's me. So what's the first thing what what's the first thing that we do? Beta Yes, what do we produce? How many do we have? Well, 
we're parsing it, there's only going to be two. When we look at it here, how many do we have? Three. Three. So is this any different than x, y, foo? So how do we group those? The leftmost things happen first, right? So implicitly, these things are grouped together. And you may notice when you look at the Y combinator definition, right, that it's not, it's not in, it's not fully beta reduced, right? It, even just looking at it, you can see that there's a beta reduction that you could do, right? The way it is now, you can replace in here the X in this body with the thing on the right. But we'll see that it actually kind of makes a lot of sense for you to show it in this form. Even though when we use it here, when we say y foo, right, the very first thing we're going to do is on the left that has nothing to do with foo. Everybody on board with that? So inside this body here, so we're going to replace x with this expression. Do we have to worry about changing meta variable names on the left expression? No, because it's a combinator, right? There are no free variables in this expression. So we are going to, inside this body, replace both of these free x's with this expression. Got it? Cool. So we have lambda y dot y, lambda x dot lambda y, y, x, x, y, lambda x dot lambda y dot y, x, x, y, y. Oh, but look. When we just replace these two x's in here with this, what do we put here? Another y. Another y. Is that a guess? You look surprised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can actually even, oh, I guess I'm getting there in a second. So what we have in here is another y, but we'll look at that in a second. Now, Let's substitute in foo for y. Right? So we have at the outermost, we have the application. On the left, we have this giant thing. And on the right, we have foo. So inside this body here, we're going to replace every free y with foo. So if we look just in this body, is this y free by removing this part? Yes. This y will be free. What about this y? No. No, it's going to be bound here, this y. Found here, this y. Found no. here, this y. Found no. here, this y. Yes. yes. So we were replacing foo in two different places. So we will have foo, this thing, this thing, foo. But as we just saw, what is this part? So we have y foo. So we have foo applied to y foo. So then what would happen if we expanded this one again? We get the same thing. We get foo, foo, y foo. And then if we expand that y foo again, we get foo, 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 y foo. And we can keep doing this forever. So we've essentially created a loop here where we can execute foo an arbitrary number of times because we can just keep doing this loop. If statement, we'll see. Yeah, just like a normal recursion, we're going to have an if statement. So if it's true, we'll see we'll return something. Otherwise, we'll do exactly. We'll do the y foo again. So why does this work? What is it about the structure of this y combinator that allows this to work? Yeah, so the key thing here, I think, is this xxy, right? So this xx is replicating itself. It's replicating the y combinator into this other call here, and then also passing into that whatever you originally passed into it, this y, and then it's also applying that result to whatever y was. And then if you have to call this again, this will keep going, and it will keep expanding out however much you want. And it's each of these beta reductions, so it's cool. Here we have basically a bit of 
lambda calculus, a lambda calculus expression that not only propagates itself, right? Because we've seen if we have like id, what do we have? x dot xx, and we apply that to itself, it's just going to keep going forever. I think that one actually keeps expanding forever. And this one will keep replicating itself and calling foo, essentially applying foo however many times you want. So then that y represents that whole state, that whole statement. Itself. Yes, the y represents this whole statement. So that's the key here, is that this y can always be replaced with this, right? Because we're not, and we don't have, we will not have any circular definitions. How you doing? This stuff's weird. This is how we're going to use it. We're going to use it like y foo. Well, we'll see exactly how we use it. We'll write a function that doesn't just take in a number. It takes in a number and a y combinator. Okay. And we'll see kind of how that propagates. But this is just to show you what happens when we see a y combinator with any expression on the right. This is what it's going to do. Right? This could be uh, an abstraction. And so it's going to keep applying that result. So let's step through and kind of see what our factorial function now would look like. So this is the function we'd want to write. But we can't write this. Everyone agree? Yes. Yes. We cannot write this. We're defining factorial in terms of itself. So now in this function, we're taking an n. We're taking in n is the number, right, which makes sense. We're calculating the factorial of a number. We're taking one number. We're either going to return, and we will return, you know, a number in our lambda calculus in our uh, church numeral scheme. So, but this new version is going to be slightly different. So what we will return is y. So we have the y combinator that we've already seen applied to now a function that takes in two parameters. The first parameter is f, which as we'll see is going to be the y combinator. And the n is the number. So let's step through this a little bit to see kind of what happens. So if we define factorial like this, and we have factorial of 1, What's going to happen? So our factorial, so we have lambda f dot lambda n dot if size 0 n, return 1, otherwise multiply n by f predecessor of n 1. Cool. OK. This is where it starts getting crazy. Can you guys see that in the back? Back row? Yeah. OK. So and what we're going to use, we're going to use basically the, what the y combinator is going to do. right? The y combinator is going to, uh, I have to make sure I actually did this right. OK. I see. It is right? Thank you. Okay, so we're first going to reduce the thing on the left, right? We know that it's leftmost here, and we're going to skip what the y, we're going to skip all of the y combinator steps, right? So we're going to take this as, just like before, we had y foo. So we're going to say this returns foo y foo. Cool. So here we have foo, let's see if that's right. Lambda f dot lambda n dot if size 0 n 1 multiply n f predicate of n. So this is foo in this case. So here we have foo applied to y foo. All that applied to 1. Good. So just doing that y combinator operation once. OK, now I know where we're going with this. So, 
On the right here, what do we have? So if we think, sorry, there's not really right and left. In this lambda expression here, we have y lambda f dot lambda n dot if size 0 n 1 multiply n f predicate of n. What is that? What was it? Factorial. That is our definition of factorial. Right? And so when we are going to substitute that in for f here, we're essentially going to put f where we wanted factorial to be. We're essentially putting the definition of factorial back in there. So we're letting the y combinator generate us basically a copy of our own code, and we're going to kind of insert it where we wanted that call to be. So let's do that. So let's reduce this, substitute that in for f. We're going to have lambda n dot if is 0 n 1 multiply n. And this part in here is factorial, factorial of predecessor of n. But specifically, we're not using the name factorial. But it is the factorial function, right? I mean, it's exactly as we've defined it right here. Y lambda f dot lambda n dot lambda n if size 0 n 1 multiply n f predicate of n. Now it's starting to get a little hairy, right? We have lots of predicates and n's and f's. But we can still walk through this very carefully, right, and see exactly what's going to happen. So now let's finally start to do some calculation and let's substitute 1 for n. Right? We have that as our body. So now we say, okay, all the, so let's remove this lambda n here. All of the free n's in here, we're going to replace them with 1. So that should be just this n and this n. Correct? Because inside here, this lambda n blocks all of those n's. All right, let's see if that's correct. Oh, except for this n here. Ah, this is when stuff gets tricky. All right? So now we have if is 0, 1, 1. Multiply 1 times all this. Time, multiply this, which is foo, which is factorial. Multiply factorial of predecessor of 1. So we have a couple things. So this if statement. So what is 0, 1 going to return? False. false. And now we have if and we have false. So which of the two arguments is it going to return? The second one. So it's going to go away and it's going to return multiply 1 by this whole thing. Right? Times the predecessor of 1. So we'll say we calculate, let's see, do we calculate the predecessor? I oh, will do that later. So multiply 1 times the factorial of the predecessor of 1. Cool. So then what happens when we do this? Well, we should, yeah, let's see. I don't know if that's going to be more or less confusing. But let's, oh, hello. Where are we at? Did we do the recursive first? I think so. Well, that's all right. We're still getting to the same place. Okay. So essentially the concept is that, that it'll keep calling or that the previous factorial code over and over again until the first one is evaluated. To true. Yes, but without a name, exactly. Once we get to where that if statement will evaluate to true, it will return 1 and it will get rid of the y factorial call. Right? It'll get rid of that and that will return 1 and we'll finally kind of essentially you think of it as coming back up the call chain because we've reached our base case. So let's see, let's step through this one more time. So we have y foo here again. So just like before, we'll end up having foo, y of foo. So I multiply one, foo here, y of foo, predecessor of zero. Oh, I remember why we haven't reduced this, because we're doing it kind of up here. Okay. And once again, we replace this thing, which y f of, this is factorial, so we're going to replace f 
in here with factorial, which gives us the ability to call it again if we need to. And now we can reduce the predecessor of 1 is 0. Now inside here, we're going to replace n with 0. So we say if is 0, 0 return 1. Otherwise, multiply this by this. And so is 0, 0 will return true. And so of these two branches, right, of these two choices, we're going to return 1. Because that's the way we've defined true. It will always return the true branch. And so we multiply 1 by 1, and we get 1. Yes? Uh, is the predecessor just minus 1 from there? Yes, so it'd be n minus 1 is what it returns. Uh, it's, it's tricky. Is 0 we could probably do as a class, maybe, but uh, predecessor would require a lot more kind of depth. But really, I mean, you saw we did addition. You saw you did multiplication. I don't think it's that big of a stretch to believe that we can go backwards and do subtraction. Um, so I think this is the more important part, is really seeing that this crazy way that we've, writ we've written this y combinator actually allows us to have recursion. So the fact that it replicates itself and the function that it wants to go to is really cool. Because then we can use that ability where we would want to make a recursive call, we would have that as a parameter being passed to us, and what will be passed to us is the Y combinator with ourselves. So we'll end up calling ourselves. <coughs> questions on this? There's got to be questions. This stuff's ridiculous. Yes? Do we have to remember that all things, or can we remember y equals to y, uh, whole y? Oh. <coughs> Better question. <laughs> that is a good question. Wait, no, let me answer that question first. Uh, let's put it this way. I want you to know the behavior. You should understand the behavior of the y combinator and how it's used. Um, if I ever wanted you to know specifically this thing, I would give you the definition. Are the questions on the exam pertaining to this going to be multiple choice? Uh, no comment? I don't know. <laughs> not a big fan of multiple choice questions. They're yeah. so easy to grade, though. I had, tell me about it. So, so, and ladies like this, were they, were they used white combinators? Is it based, based on the instructions, is just wherever it sees that factorial replace it with the, that the, the code for what it's doing over and over? So in a language, so in a language like Lisp, uh, it really it uses the syntax of lambda expressions. So when you look at it, it's all parentheses like this. So maybe mm, I don't know if I have anything sensitive in there. I can maybe pull up my uh, my Emacs configuration really quickly. It's in a really weird version of uh, yeah, that's fine. So like here, so this is an elisp file. So this is an elisp uh, file, so you can see all the parentheses. So the syntax is very similar. So this is, says like, uh, when the computer is, Mac, is a Mac, set the Mac command key modifier to meta. So it's very similar in that inside every expression, so inside all the parentheses, the thing on the left is most times a function, sometimes a macro, but that I don't want to use too much, uh, is a function, and the other ones are parameters. So the differences are a, so do I have any deaths? Let's see. I guess I should check this to make sure I don't have any passwords in here. <laughs> uh, yeah. So these are, so this was the, that command that I just ran. So defun is to define a function. So here you're defining a function name, set frame for hacking group. The thing in the next list is the parameters to the function and then the body here. So in most lists, you have the ability to call functions again. So there, you don't usually need, uh, you don't usually need the Y combinator. It's more like, it, it shows you that you don't actually need. When you think about what is at the base of computation, right? What actually is necessary? 
It turns out, in a language with only functions, you don't need named functions to do recursion. Right? So that in itself is a very powerful idea. You would still, just like you never want to program a Turing machine, like write code for a Turing machine, it's very important because it has that idea that you can reduce any com computation, any crazy language that you write, to something that can work on a Turing machine. So yeah, the ideas here are the really important, really cool things here. So now that we've seen this, why do you think a startup incubator of all things, besides being huge nerds, why they used what the why they named their startup incubator Y Combinator? Hmm? Yeah, because they take in startups and they can like make more startups, right? They're a startup themselves. They're trying to take in startups and make more startups, right? So it's kind of it's very similar vibes. Uh, so I think it was a pretty cool uh, decision on them to do that. Questions? Okay. So now we've seen, we actually are, we've had Boolean logic, we have arithmetic, we have loops, now we have recursion. Now I will make the claim that we're Turing complete. So how would you show that? Or prove it. I mean, how would you prove that? Yeah, so one way to do that would be to show that you can simulate a Turing machine using lambda calculus. That would show that you could go one way, right? What about the other way if you're trying to say that they're the same? Yeah, you want to go backwards, right? You want to write a Turing machine that can simulate lambda calculus, and then you're showing that they're both at the same expressivity level, right? So there's no program. Fundamentally, there's nothing you can do on a Turing machine that you can't do in lambda calculus. And because we know that the languages that we program in are Turing complete, that means there's nothing that you can do in C or Java that you can't do on a Turing, on a Turing machine or using lambda calculus. So that's the uh, church, I think it's the church tur Turing hypothesis. I should have looked that up. Thesis. Thesis, there we go, yeah. I knew that was wrong. <laughs> we just talked about it. Ah, dang, okay. Well, then you guys know all these answers. <laughs> <things. laughs> so did you guys talk about lambda calculus in 355? Nope. Uh, I think mentioned it, but we didn't write it. Is that what we talked about? Hmm. Yeah, I think we used words like function, <laughs> loops. Cool. Um, yeah, so any questions on this? Okay, so what we'll do, so this is actually the end of Lambda Calculus, and I'm just as surprised as you all are. Um, we actually got here very quickly. I think last semester I was like rushing over this last part on recursion, but I think that we actually went through it at enough level that give you some of the intuition because I think those are the really important things. So class-wise, what we'll do is on Friday, I'll use class like office hours kind of. So come bearing questions, I will go over things, I will do things, but it will be entirely driven by the people in the room. So come with your questions. You can have midterm questions, homework questions, project five questions, whatever. Uh, happy to answer. Uh, I'll also, since I mean, we still have 10 minutes, um, if you want to leave, leave. I will hold, I can hold like a post-class office hour session for 10 minutes if you guys have questions. So, well, let me start a new recording. Uh, can you give us tips for the final, I guess? It's, it's uh, let's see, tips for the final? It'll definitely be cumulative. What's the distribution of the content? Uh, that's something I'm not... So you gotta think about it from my perspective, right? The point of an exam is not to is not to test you on specific things, but to improve your knowledge of the course, right? So if I tell you it's only gonna be this, that's all you'll study. I want you to study everything and I'm gonna pick certain things. Um, if you were looking at the class closely, you think, huh, midterm three included some content from midterm two. 
specifically because people didn't do so good on that part. So that would be something interesting to think about is I may look at the things and say, hmm, people didn't do really well on this. No. <laughs> you have to look inside for that. But yeah, otherwise cumulative, it should be, it's not going to be any huge curveballs or anything. Nothing, nothing outrageous that you haven't seen. The other thing I think about is I haven't, there's stuff that we covered after midterm three that you haven't been tested on. Any other questions?